siren is all about, the fetcher siren going off outside. We just want to check up on that. So I was asking the Lord on the subject that we would just share with together this morning and um, the Holy Spirit just keeps taking me back to the prophetic. And so this morning I wanted to share with you the prophetic power of testimony, the prophetic power of testimony and just talk a little bit about how important the testimony that um, the experiences that we have with the Lord, those supernatural experiences where um, God just does amazing things, not only in us, but often through us, um, and that it becomes our witness of the glory and the power of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I wanted to talk to you about that. If you would turn with me to Mark chapter 5. This is a very familiar portion of scripture. I'm really going to touch on one verse uh, in this, in this uh, portion of scripture, and then I'm going to move on also to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Incidentally, if you want to follow along with us in the notes, we post them up on our Facebook. If you go to, uh, to our Living Faith Christian Assembly, Nutley Facebook, you'll find all of the notes there for this morning's sermon, and you can just follow along with us. Those also serve as a help for you if you want to go back uh, during the week and maybe just um, go over the service. We tape the entire service. First of all, it's broadcast live here, but we also have it uh, where you can go back during the week. You can pull up your notes. And uh, maybe there are just some things that the Lord wants to refresh, some things that we may have missed along the way. But if you uh, would read along with me now in Mark chapter 5 and verse, starting with verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him, Jesus, to depart from their region. Could you imagine that? Asking Jesus to leave? Lord, we really don't want you here. We're intimidated by your power. So we're going to ask you to leave. Wow. And you know what I find about Jesus here is he doesn't argue with them. Verse 18 says, And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. And verse 19, However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion passion on you. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And then if you would turn with me quickly to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Here the angel of the Lord is giving John a tour, not only of heaven, but also giving him a glimpse of things to come in the age in which the Lord will return. And it says here in verse chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 10, he says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. 
worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, um, sometime earlier this year, I just wanted to sit before the Lord and listen to his voice clearly, so I went on a fast. And during that period of time, just to clarify some things in my own life and just clarify some things concerning ministry and uh, just in, in, in the place and the season that I was in, I wanted the Lord to speak to me during that period of time that I sat there. And um, at the end of the fast, I began to ask the Lord concerning other things, but also concerning the ministry. I said, Lord, we have wonderful people in our church, some really good families, some wonderful individuals that are talented, filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, show me if there's anything that is missing in our ministry, something that we can address and make sure that you're able to move freely in our ministry. I mean, I think we have, and maybe I'm biased, but I think we have the best worship team on the planet. Yes. Amen. I mean, young men and women that are just going hard after God, and um, when we just join in with them, I, I just feel the presence of the Lord in this place. And as I was reminiscing on that, I was kind of thinking to myself, well, what possibly could be, you know, what could the Lord actually, you know, bring to mind? Something like this. And I kept hearing the voice of the Lord say this. You're missing testimony. You're missing testimony. And I'm not talking about just testimony time. You're missing the proclamation of witness of what I'm doing. And as I began to hear the voice of the Lord speak to me, I began to actually research. You know, today with Google, you can Google anything, right? And I began to just research some amazing stories, some things that God had done in some, some churches and ministries along the way, not necessarily even in the States, but somewhere. The Lord is doing, and there were just too many, but I just wanted to share a couple of them with you if I could this morning. This testimony is of a little boy who got healed one night at a regional renewal meeting in one of the towns in Northern California coast. At that time, he was three years old and had fairly severe club feet. Does everybody know what a club feet is? Club feet is when one foot is shorter than the other. Anybody see people like that? Where one foot is longer and the other foot is shorter. It's for whatever reason, that other foot just didn't grow all the way out. And so this little boy who was three years old had, these club, had this club foot. And the Bible, there was a Bible school professor that was preaching at the conference and had brought with him his students from the school of ministry to the meeting. And so they began to pray for this little boy after the message. When they set him on the ground, his feet were perfectly flat for the first time. Another little boy that was his friend came over and said to him, run. And this little boy began to run all over the sanctuary. Two feet were flat on the ground for the first time in his life. The next day, these students from the school of ministry, still fired up about the miracles and the little boy, went down to the local mall and looked for, the, and looked for people to show God's love with prayer. A couple of them noticed an older woman walking with a leg brace and a cane and decided she was a good candidate for prayer. You think? They approached her and asked her if they could pray for her. And she told them flatly no. But the students persisted, I love that, and, and explained that they had just seen a little boy healed of club feet. After they shared their testimony and with much persistence, the woman had a change of heart and said that they could pray for her. They first prayed for her knee, which had a tumor on it. As they began to pray, the tumor disappeared, so the woman removed her brace. Then the Lord showed one of the students through a word of knowledge that he was also healing her back 
and that the fire of God's presence was touching a specific place in her back. When the student pointed to that exact spot, the woman found that the other tumor had disappeared as well. She had never told them about that one. The woman walked out of that mall carrying her cane and her leg brace. It reminded me of the story that Jeremy told when he came back from Kansas City and he was driving himself back home. And without going into all the particulars, he drove into a gas station and he was getting gas and there was someone there that had a leg brace and the Lord spoke to him and said, go and pray for that man with the leg brace. You know, Jeremy felt, you know, a little bit awkward just walking up to somebody and beginning to pray for them. You know, he had the fire of the Holy Spirit. He just spent two years in Bible school and uh, was, you know, uh, filled with, with, you know, just the presence of the Holy Spirit, but yet he was still timid. And he said he got back into his car after he, they gassed it up and he began to leave. And as he was leaving, he heard the voice of the Lord say to him, I told you to pray for that man and that I would heal that man. And so as he's getting on the highway, the Lord begins to just reveal to him his power. And Jeremy just begins to just break down in the car. He, was, he began to break down to the point where as the Holy Spirit is, is, is speaking to him, he forgets what speed limit he's going and the cop pulls him over. and gives him a ticket, a speeding ticket, all the way home. And Jeremy is saying to himself, oh no, now God is punishing me not praying for this guy. So he gets in the car, and that's it, and he goes off. And as he's going down the road, I guess, you know, he's still emotional, so he forgets the speed limit, and another cop pulls him over. He gets a second ticket. So now you would think, man, I'm really discouraged about this. And I don't know about you, but, you know, normal people would just say, you know what, God, I can't pray for anybody right now. I've got to pray for myself. But he says these words after he takes the ticket from the cop. He says, Lord, I'm going to pull into another gas station. If there's somebody there with a brace on their knee, I'm going to get out of my car and begin to pray for them. And so he pulls into this gas station, and um, he's just kind of waiting around because he's already gassed up from the last one, although he probably went through half a tank of gas with the tickets that he got. But... Um, he gets in, and he's just waiting around, and he's saying to himself, God, this is just something that I'm going to be able to just move on, and that'll be it. It'll be an experience. And just as he's about to get back into the car, out from the quick walk walks out this guy that's in a wheelchair. How many of us know the Holy Spirit takes it a step higher? And he goes over it. And so the, 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 uh, Jeremy says, you know, Lord, I promised you, so I'm going to do this. And he goes over to the man. And he says, can I pray for you? And uh, I said, sure. And as he began to pray, this guy gets up out of his chair and takes the brace that he had off on his knee. And he begins to run up and down the gas station. He said for the first time, he said, I got out of this chair and I'm able to walk on my own without any assistance. And so as he's doing this, somebody else was in the area. Actually, what happened was this, Jeremy said to him, okay, now I want you to go to church and testify about this. And other people were coming around him now. They were coming out of the quick market and then they were wondering what, what the commotion was over here. They saw this empty wheelchair and this guy running up and down. And Jeremy said, I want you to go to church. And the guy began to break down. He said, I was raised in church. And I left church because all I kept finding was condemnation. People who would point their fingers at me. 
And he said that I've been sitting in this place by myself in this chair. The chairman said, I want you to go back to church. He says, I'm afraid to go back to church. Jeremy says, if I give you $20, will you go to church? <laughs> Not only because he got the two tickets, and now he's giving the guy 20 bucks to go to church. Well, I don't know what happened after that, but certainly the guy went over and said he was going to church. I say this because there is power in testimony. When he came home and he started telling us what God had done in his life, that I began to get chills of my spine because this is what the church is called to do. Look, coming in a nice air-conditioned building and singing wonderful songs and listening to a sermon to inspire us is not what God has called the church to do. Individually, we are the church of Jesus Christ. If no one else were around you, you're still the church of Jesus Christ. And so as I began to just reminisce on these things about how the Lord had worked in, in these other lives, and even through the life of my own son, I began to reminisce on my own life, how the Lord spared me on September 11th through that catastrophic terroristic attack. I began to uh, uh, reminisce how the Lord healed my left eye at a, at a conference a, a few years back. Joe was there along with Jeremy where uh, I had gone the year before to the same conference and they have a time in the middle of the service where they pray for the sick and just as they were praying for the sick somebody said there is somebody here that has an eye condition the Lord wants to heal you and I felt in my spirit that that was me so I went up and I got prayed for all the leaders were around me they prayed for me and I have to say that when they finished praying they told me to look around nothing had changed I was still as blurry as I always had been. And I was discouraged about it. But I went home that day for an entire year. I would not bring myself to say that God had not healed me. I would just tell people, I just see the same. I don't see any, any difference. That next year I went, it was a day, it was a year to the day, to the same day, in that same Saturday night service that they were praying for the sick. And as they were praying for the sick, I just put my left hand over my left eye. I had keratoconus, by the way. It's a disease of the cornea that only gets rectified with a corneal transplant. And even those that have it don't normally see 100%. You'll have to wear these special glasses for the rest of your life. And I have keratoconus in my left eye. And I put my hand over the eye. I said, Lord, look, I, I just believe it. I don't know what to say. I'm not going up there to pray again. I'm right here. You're right here with me. And if this is your word to me, I expect to hear or expect to see. Well, I take my hand away from my eye. And for the first time in years, I saw absolutely clearly out of my left eye. Yeah. So, you know, I put my hand over my right eye to make sure that, you know, I wasn't cheating in any way. And I began to look around. And um, now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm vain. I like to carry a Bible with me that has words that are like microscopic. So, like, you know, I, I don't like those Bibles with the big words because I'm, I'm you know, I'm just, that's the way I am. So I, I carry this Bible with me and I couldn't read it, but I would carry it along with me to the conferences that I had my Bible with me and I put my hand over my right eye and with my left eye I opened up this Bible and I just began to read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter with my left eye that I couldn't see before. The Lord had absolutely healed me that day. And I began to look at that. And then I began to reminisce about how the Lord in this place, in this ministry, had healed people that were here. Remember Gloria? How many of us remember Gloria? Gloria was diagnosed with lupus. Lupus is an incurable disease. They'll give you medication to help you sustain yourself through it. But Gloria came up after one service and she began to just pray with us. My wife and I were praying for her. And as we were praying for her, after she finished, she got up and she said, Pastor, I feel the Lord did something. I said, hey, amen, I'm going to believe that with you. That week, she went back to her doctor, the same doctor that took the blood test. 
And she said to him, I want another blood test. I believe the Lord healed me. And you know how the doctors are. Come on. These tests are always right. You're wasting your time. No, no, doctor, I want another test. I believe the Lord has healed me. Well, she persisted. The doctor gave her another blood test and he came out with his face was white. He said, I don't see any traces. Uh, Julio, is that right? I don't see any traces of lupus in your body. An absolute miracle, an absolute. And, and she stood here and she proclaimed that, what God had done in her life, and it lifts up the church. And then also, I remember when uh, young, uh, when, when, when Isabel had, was expecting the baby, little Geraldine, and the doctors, I don't remember all the particulars, but the doctors had told her there was something wrong with the baby, right? There was something wrong with the baby. Was it the fact that the baby wasn't moving? They couldn't get, uh, they couldn't get a heartbeat. They thought that the baby was dead. Um, and uh, I, I remember Victor, her husband, Julio's brother. I tell you what, God works in the Guerrero family. <laughs> yeah. And so he began, you know, he just stood on the word of the Lord. And he said, I'm going to pray over this child, over my wife, and we are not going to abort this baby. And so they went through the pregnancy, and, and the doctors the entire time were telling you, you've got to abort because the, the mother's life is in, is in jeopardy here. Well, you know what? Today, little Cheryl is running all over the place. She's not so little anymore. When I saw her the last time, she's growing up to be a young little lady. And um, what the doctors had proclaimed over her, the Lord's voice was greater than that. Yes. Why do I tell you these things? I got an entire sermon that I didn't get into. I tell you these things. Because the power of the Lord is real. And it's up to us as children of God to believe what God is saying, even when it comes in the face of all adversity. And all the other voices are telling us to do something else and to bow to the other voices. That the voice of the Lord, when we walk by faith and not by sight, the voice of the Lord not only sustains us, but God is able to do great things. Listen, if I pray for somebody this morning that has cancer and that person doesn't get healed, I'm not the healer. The Holy Spirit is the healer. And now if you go with the same experience that I had, maybe the Lord hasn't revealed something in that moment, but on your way home, God is able to heal you of that cancer that is there. We are instruments were those that come with the word of the Lord and were obedient. We, we said we believe what God says. And if Jesus did these things in his day, if the Lord is able to do these things through an early church, he's able to do these things today. He walks with us today. He never changes with us because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen, God allows us to experience supernatural encounters with him to unveil his presence and to release his power in healing and deliverance, breaking out the kingdom of God around us on earth as it is that very moment in heaven. Listen, when the Holy Spirit breaks out the kingdom of God, what is happening around you is happening that very moment in heaven. And it has been declared in heaven. We bind things on earth, they will be bound in heaven. We bind things in heaven. We release things in heaven. They will be released on the earth. Why? Because we walk in the power of the one whose word is eternal. The Bible tells us here in Revelations 19.10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of the brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Listen to that. Underline that in your Bible. Your brethren have the testimony of Jesus. Jesus. When we walk about, we have the testimony of Jesus. And we have been saved by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We walk with the testimony of Jesus. It is what God has done in our own life. Listen, don't go looking at what God is doing in another life unless God first does it in your own life. This is where it starts, right here. It starts with me. Everybody say it starts with me. And as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and what God has done with me, then we work, then we look at the following portion of that verse. It says, worship God. In the process of everything we're doing, we're 
worshiping God. We're not worshiping medicine. We use medicine. We need medicine. God has given medicine, but we don't worship medicine. We don't worship what, what, the, what the, the culture says. We worship God. We stand on the word of the Lord. And then he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus in us has already spoken out. Listen, the spirit of prophecy is something that has already taken place in the spiritual realm. You see, we always wait for things that are that are that are in the natural, and then we can we can come together and agree with those things. But no, we agree with those things in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm. The the Bible says that we call out things that are not as if they are. Why? Because the voice of the Lord has already been there. Everybody said God's voice is already there. Maybe you're praying for healing. You're not seeing anything. But as you're praying, the Bible says that your prayer comes before the Lord. It is in this bowl of incense that continuously rises before the Lord. And the more you pray, the more that incense comes before the Lord. Listen, God can smell everything. And that incense is sweet before the Lord. It moves the hand of God. I'm not saying you change the mind of God, but you move the hand of God as you continue to pray over something. And as we pray, listen, the voice of the Lord is already there. Just like Jeff was, was praying this morning when Daniel was praying out to the Lord. His, his voice had reached the throne of God and God immediately released it. Testimony and prophecy have always been an important element of the, of the Christian life. And in the context of, the, of Revelation 19.10, they, they are unified, they are united in declaring the truth of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal what? The glory of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 to kind of follow up with that, he says, and he said to them, go into all the world and and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, he's given us his authority. He's given us his power. When the Holy Spirit comes and he rests upon you, he rests upon me. He's giving us the same authority that he gave Jesus. Go out and preach the gospel to every creature. What does it mean to preach the gospel? What is he talking about there? It is the real life personal experiences of demonstration of God's power and authority that we evidence in our own encounter with the sick, with the diseased, with the broken, with the wounded, with the demonically possessed people who have been set free to declare the power of God in their lives. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7, he says, and as you go, preach, say what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As you're praying for somebody who's lame, as you're praying for somebody who has cancer, as you're praying for someone that is in dire need of hope in their lives, we begin to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. That means the kingdom of God is here with us. And as the kingdom of God is with us, the Holy Spirit and His power is released so that heaven on earth can take place. And he says in that verse 8, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, Raise the dead. Wow, that, that was done back then, Pastor. Jesus Christ is seen yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, say it with me. Jesus Christ is seen yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is still saving souls today. Hello? The Lord can still save Congress. Hello. He can still intervene in this government. I know a lot of people have given up, but God can still intervene. It's the prayers of the saints. The kingdom of God is among us. Freely you've received. Freely give. God gives us 
heaven on earth encounters, whether they be for our need or to use as instrument for us to be used as instruments to reveal his healing or restoration of relationships in marriage and family dynamics or deliverance of demonic attacks or supernatural provisions for finances. Listen, all these things as we're praying by the power of the Holy Spirit and we declare the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is around me. The kingdom of God is before me. The kingdom of God is powerful. The kingdom of God has released the power through me. And I declare the word of the Lord over myself, over my house, over my relationships, over my finances. I declare the, the, the word of the Lord over myself, over my body. I declare the, the word of the Lord over my mind. Come on. We have too many people that go to church that are suffering in their mind. They're being attacked in the mind. And what we declare is that the spirit of the Lord is greater than the only other voices that come against Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He interrupts, God interrupts our lives with his presence so that the encounter becomes our testimony to prophesy over people. God's not giving us an encounter with him so we can put it in the corner. You know, oh, that's private. Can I share this, Jeff? When we, when we were talking a little bit inside, uh, Jeff was saying, you know, can I pray for, you know, such and such a person? And I said, yes, as the Lord is bringing them to your mind, just, just pray for them. Nothing is a secret before God. Somebody say amen. amen. Look, if I'm in the middle of the water and I'm drowning, I'm not going to keep it a secret. I'm yelling as loud as I can, and I want a lot of people to hear me. If you keep quiet, if you keep quiet, you'll drown. That was a powerful prayer this morning, my brother. I was ministered to that. Prophecy either foretells the future or causes a change in the present. Prophecy either foretells the future or it causes a change in the present. Too often, you know, we're used to, you know, the prophetic voice saying, thus said the Lord, and you know, all these things that are about to come. But the fact of the matter is that prophecy isn't limited to what's happening in the future. How many of us know God's already there? So God isn't waiting to get there. His voice isn't waiting to get there. He's already there. Everybody say God's already there. Right. right. So the prophetic voice isn't only changing what's going on out there for us, but it's, it's changing the things around here right now. The things, the, the enemy that's attacking right now, the other voices that are trying to silence the voice of the Lord. Right now, the voice of the Lord is going out even greater, even deeper, even more magnified than all the other voices. A testimony then becomes a catalytic in its ability to bring about a change of atmosphere in the present, making room for the supernatural release. You know what a catalytic is? It's something, a catalytic converter in a car is something that ignites. It allows the rest of the engine to start off. Without a cattle, without this portion of the engine to, to ignite, you could turn your key or push the button, whatever you do these days. You can even call from your car, you know? You can, you can actually start your, your yeah, you, you got one too? Oh. I used to love doing it from my car. You know, I could just imagine somebody walking by my car, there's nobody there, it was a boom. But, Without this catalytic portion of your engine, there's nothing to start the car. Well, this is what our testimony becomes the catalyst that starts the power of the Holy Spirit to spread out. Because what God did in your life, He can do in my life. He can do in my family. He can do in my workplace. He can do in my worship. He can do in my body. 
what God has done for you. And so what we're actually declaring is God does this. Everybody say God does this. That's what we're doing. When we declare through testimony what God has done through us, we declare God is still doing this. So when we testify of the power of God in and through our experiences with the Holy Spirit, we make two assumptions. The first one is that if God has done this great thing for us, he would surely do it for others. And secondly, that declaring our testimony is the vehicle by which God's promise will be transmitted to the needs of others. So the first assumption is clearly supported in Scripture, which Jesus says in Hebrews 13, 8, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, it says that God is no respecter of person. In other words, the same things God did in the biblical days, he's doing today. Everybody say he's doing it today. The same thing. We need to allow him to do it. Did you see what happened when we were reading that story of the person that was delivered from the demonic? That the people that heard it were intimidated. They were afraid of the power of Jesus. And what did the Bible say? They asked him to leave. They asked him to leave. And what does the Bible say in the next verse? You see Jesus getting into the boat. And he's leaving. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. We can suffocate the voice of the Holy Spirit. We can hinder the move of God. Just the way we are vessels to release it, we can also be a hindrance to stop it. This is why it's so important that even in corporately when we come together for prayer, that we're not just allowing ourselves to kind of wander off and just kind of, you know, sleep there or what have you, but we're interceding together. We're in a battle together. And as we release what God wants to do, we see the power of the Holy Spirit begin to work. Like I said, we can't heal anybody ourselves. But it's the power and the word of the Holy Spirit that brings healing and deliverance. What we are called to do unequivocally is to be obedient to the word of the Lord and begin to pray. Maybe God wants to reveal something in us more than he's looking to do something in the person that we may be praying for. He wants to release our faith. He wants us to grow in his word. He wants us to depend on him even more. In other words, the same things that God did, he's able to do. He's doing them through, this, through the same type of people that he did in the biblical days. Those who are simply believing that God is and he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6 That as we diligently seek the will of God, that the Holy Spirit is able to move through us. We must intentionally share testimonies. Those that we minister ourselves and those that have closely observed and been a witness in the result of God's awesome power. God acts, God, God's acts reveal his ways, and his ways reveal his nature. Thus the revelation of the power of our witness brings to us the realization that testimony is a foundational kingdom principle with implications for every areas of our lives. Stand with me this morning. Our capacity to remember what God has said and done in our lives and throughout history, the testimony is one of the primary things that determine our success or failure in sustaining a kingdom lifestyle of power for miracles. I'm going to share one more testimony with you. 
I ask you to bow your heads. Just reflect on your own heart. Because I'm sure for every testimony that I have, you have one as well. I was 11 years old. We were living in Manhattan. So my parents, to keep us off the street, enrolled me right across the street. There was the 92nd Street Y. It had a school of music. I learned to play the violin there. But it also had a gymnasium. And so every day after school, I would come home and go to the gymnasium. And this one day, I was playing kickball. I was 11 years old. The ball hit my hand as I was trying to stop that. And if I tell you that the fingers on my hand, you see that I can't go any further back. The fingers on my hand hit the top of my forearm. I didn't go to the doctor, so I can't tell you medically that I broke my wrist, but I can tell you from the pain that I experienced that I broke my wrist. And so I, I didn't want to go home and tell my parents. One, because I didn't want to worry them and they wouldn't send me back to the gym. But secondly, I was afraid of getting the dog. Every Tuesday night, down in Manhattan, at the Statler Hilton at that time, they had the Christian Businessmen's Association of Conference. Come on, everybody, just pay attention here, right here, right here. Focus here. And as I was at this conference, I remember I was with my young man that we were sitting all the way up in the balcony. And I was in throbbing pain. I did not want to go to this, to this meeting. It happened every Tuesday night. I said, you know, I'll go next Tuesday night, but my aunt was persistent. I wrapped up my, my arm to the best that I could inside, and then I put a long sleeve shirt on so nobody could see me. And I was in pain the entire time of the service. And that time, during the service, they had prayer for healing. And as they were healed, as they were praying, that uh, they had a group of people that had club feet. We just spoke about club feet. One foot shorter than the other. And they had a, a group of chairs lined up on the, on the pulpit. And they were going to pray that these people, their feet would come together again. And so, they said for everybody to pray as they began to pray over these people. And you know how I'm praying? Well, I can't use this hand, but I had this hand free. So I was praying like this, because I wanted to see the miracle happen. And you know, as they prayed for each one individually, with my own eyes, back then I didn't have character comments. But with my own eyes, I saw one foot after the other right down the line, just grow right out. And then after he had finished crying, he came to the mic and he said, there is a young man in the balcony. You have a wrist problem. Right now, the Lord is healing you. Two thousand people in that room. God saw me. The moment he said that, without hesitation, there was a heat stroke that went from the top of my shoulder and ran right down like fire down into the tip of my fingers, right through my wrist. Immediately, the pain left. You know how sometimes you're just afraid to test something out because you don't want to prove something wrong? Not me. I started going like this. 11 years old. I was going like this. I wanted to test it out. I wanted to make sure that he's... I tell you this this morning. Because God 
wants to do something in your life. Because the next time you're in ShopRite, Stop and shop or wherever it is that you go and you see somebody in a wheelchair, you see somebody that has a place, that you obey the voice of the Lord and you begin to pray. You're not supposed to heal them. The Holy Spirit is supposed to heal. We're supposed to be obedient and then when it happens, I want you to come back here and I want you to, to declare what God has done. We need to declare what God is doing. Because it is just the God of the Bible. Way back then. And he's not doing the same things today. We're wasting our time. We're wasting our time. If God doesn't baptize with the Holy Spirit today. Like he did back then. We're wasting our time. If God's not healing. If God's not raising from the dead. try to raise the dead. But sometimes with all of our conveniences, we forget God. And so this morning, I'm just going to pray over you. And I'm going to leave you this morning with the decision that you will make before the Lord on what you will do with the power of God in your life. Is God just saving you so that one day you can squeeze into heaven? Or did God save you to declare the glory of God, go and preach the gospel to every creature? Father, I just pray this morning for each and every one of us, Lord, young and old. You're not a respecter of persons. You don't ask us our age when you come to us. You simply ask us if we believe what you're saying, and that you are God. So, Father, I pray this morning, release over us fresh oil. God, if there are those of us this morning that have not received you as Lord and Savior, this seems all so impossible. So, Lord, I pray right now, right now, Holy Spirit, deal with that heart. And Lord, you're not one that brings condemnation to us. You draw us to yourself with love because that's who you are. So Lord, in love, draw the people, the person, the individual to you that does not know you as Lord and Savior and somehow is compromising their ways. I pray for salvation right now, the power of God right now over that heart. The word of the Lord that resounds and strips the devil of his key that incarcerates you. In Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, be set free in your mind, in your soul. Now I'm praying this, but you have to release it. Father, I pray for salvation. Father, I pray for those of us that are just walking about that we have received you as Lord and Savior and then we don't know what to do with ourselves. We've never prayed for anybody to get healed. We've never offered ourselves into situations that seem so impossible that only a miracle would take place. God, this morning, I pray, break in. Speak to us. Remove doubt. Silence all the other voices in Jesus' name. I silence the voice of doubt right now. The voice of fear. It destroys the people of God. I release this morning the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of love. The voice that draws us and identifies us to the Father. In Jesus' name, be set free in your life. Go. Make disciples of all nations, people. Preach the gospel to every creature. Next time you come, bring a testimony of what God has done in your life. 
and through your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.